Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Dan's co-host for the day, Jeremy Fallis, also with the Department of Communication. Today, we are celebrating Black Maternal Health Week with an important discussion about racism and biases that need to be addressed in the healthcare field. Now, let's get some quick housekeeping out of the way before we dive into that important conversation, such as how you could find previous episodes of The Wrap. Find them on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. New episodes are also available on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines week in review. And with that, let's bring in our two guests for the day. First, let's have the two of you introduce yourselves and your roles here at Michigan Medicine. Hi, I'm Leah Mitchell. I'm one of the OBGYNs in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Women's Health Division. Um, I primarily work as an OB hospitalist on the labor and delivery unit. Um, and I am Dr. Leanne Louis. I'm one of the third year OBGYN residents uh, that work with Dr. Mitchell. Um, and I am applying into Maternal Fetal Medicine Fellowship this year. Outstanding. Well, thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, now, we, we sort of previewed what the conversation was going to be about, but we know that racism is systemic. And therefore, it's embedded in the medical education system. So during your medical training, how did racial bias, either overt or implicit, present itself in your coursework and in your practical experience? And how then have the issues of race and equity shown up for you in your medical practice? So I think one of the most common ways that the um, issue of systemic um, racism has been embedded in the uh, labor and delivery unit has been through the use of a VBAC calculator. So a VBAC is a vaginal birth after cesarean section, um, and providers use that to determine someone's likelihood of having a successful vaginal delivery after having a previous cesarean section. Um, that calculator used to be very widely used and prior to being updated took into account race so that uh, women of Hispanic or Black origin were inherently at a higher risk of cesarean section um, based on this calculator. So what that meant was that even though there are no physiologic differences between white women and um, Black or Hispanic women or birthing people, uh, this calculator falsely gave them an elevated risk of needing a repeat cesarean section, which led to those women being um, counseled away from having a trial of labor after cesarean section. And we know that um, the risk of morbidity and mortality and pregnancy increases with the number of cesarean sections that you have. I think um, I'll start with like my medical training. I think in uh, medical school, it was very common that race was left out on like patient cases. Like it would be like a 29 year old female male coming in with this and only when race was included um, or the only times that race were included when it wanted to like give a stereotype in a way. So like in hematology uh, coursework, for example, every time they wanted to indicate or inch towards a person with sickle cell anemia, they included the, the, the phrase black male, black female in the, the question stem, or if they wanted to like have you lean towards the answer of lupus, for example, they always included race, but they didn't do that for any other diseases um, within our coursework. Um, and then also to just uh, piggyback a little bit on the labor and delivery floor, actually Dr. Mitchell and I actually had a patient that I think embodies a lot of what sometimes race and equity looks like. A patient who had like a issue and it was gonna have to go for cesarean uh, delivery and in the operating room, was deemed by a lot of uh, non-Black colleagues as um, being a little bit more aggressive and not wanting to cooperate for their spinal anesthesia. Um, and Dr. Mitchell and I kind of like stepped in because we were going to be doing the procedure and then just like talking with the patient and kind of like being her support, realized that, you know, this is her first surgery. She was really scared and they were playing music that to her was like funeral music. So she's like, am I, am I about to die? <laughs> and so for her, it was like a cultural aspect and she was deemed as aggressive. Whereas when Dr. Mitchell and I spoke with her, we kind of understood what was happening and literally us just kind of cocooning her and just kind of embracing her as she got her spinal within one try after that 
the spina went in and she was able to calm down. But it was Dr. Mitchell and I having to recognize the differences in culture, the differences in um, how her being in a space where she saw no one that looked like her could come off. And so that was just a really important um, scenario that I think that kind of highlights the issue of race and equity in just our medical practice on a day to day. Thank you for, for sharing those examples. I, I think those are some, I mean, I'm sure those are just two of so many different examples that the, the two of you and many other providers can can give. Uh, and I think it's it's super important to give that background. And I guess kind of moving in into a different light, you know, what have you seen that kind of needs to be addressed for us to achieve maybe a sense of justice and equity in a room like that or somewhere else uh, in, in the medical world? I guess I could start with this one. I think one thing um, that we can do is increase the number of minority providers. We know that through research, uh, having racially concordant providers with patients improve their outcomes, whereas the opposite is seen, that if it's racially discordant, those patients tend to have worse outcomes. And we, I think, recently had a lecture where um, I think through the AAMC or through the AMA, it was shown that throughout the past 10 years, the number of Black OBGYNs have not significantly increased in our country, despite the fact that there's more disparities that are being seen. There's still a wide amount of patients that are coming to us pregnant, but still the numbers, and this is not just OBGYN, it's throughout all of the other medical specialties, but that's just, for example, one thing that we can do, right? Dr. Mitchell and I had to the privilege of being in there with that patient. But if there are not a lot of people that look like us, how can that uh, bridge be gapped? Or gap be bridged, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And I think this kind of conversation will go a long way towards it. And this conversation is you know, taking place during Black Maternal Health Week. Can you tell us about the significance of Black Maternal Health Week from a provider perspective and how you think issues of Black maternal health disparities really do show up for your patients. I know we've talked about representation, right, and, and the importance of representation among providers, but what are maybe some other things that you see, you know, it, it rearing its head during your, your daily work? So I think I can speak to this from both the provider and the patient standpoint, um, as I recently had, well, she's almost two, so I guess almost two years ago, um, had a little girl at Michigan Medicine. Um, and one of the most striking things I think for me as I was even considering pregnancy is that Black women have a higher rate of morbidity, mortality during their pregnancies, even if you account for educational um, attainment. And so me as a Black OBGYN, my risk of death is higher than someone who is white but has a high school or less education. Um, it is higher than someone who is in a different like income bracket than me, it lives in a different area than me just because I am black. And so um, in even considering becoming pregnant, I had to think about, am I in a space that people will see me and see my pregnancy for who we are, um, because I know that my education is not enough to protect me from the disparities that happen. Um, I know that my husband's education and him being a physician are not enough to protect us. So maybe if I have my baby in a place where I work, um, that will protect us. And and for some people, um, like the pediatrician out in Indiana, that even was not enough for her to protect her. Um, so I know those things, and that's something that I was thinking about. My patients come into the office with those same um, kind of burdens and weights um, as the start of their pregnancies. We have recent data that shows us that being Black in America and, and experiencing racism actually increases your risk for some complications in pregnancy, like preeclampsia. Um, and so there's not something that is inherently different between Black and Brown uh, patients than than other people, but there is that just um, the weight and the like chronic stress of systemic racism that increase your risk for complications during pregnancy. So now we recommend aspirin for those patients, um, and so that's just that's something that I I experienced and thought about 
personally and something that I know that my patients are thinking about and experience um, as they start their pregnancies. And so we talk about it and even just mentioning it in the room, you can see a weight just be lifted off of, um, off of patients because they immediately feel seen and feel safer. And I would love to just add to what Dr. Mitchell said. I think that was just a, a big and great highlight about like how patients are not feeling seen and heard. And I think that is one of the most important aspects of Black Maternal Health Week. It is highlighting the fact that we recognize that Black women in America are dying at higher rates because they are pregnant or they are postpartum. And that is something that women have been or birthing people have been delivering babies for quite a bit of time and and things are still getting actually worse and not better so i think it is so important to highlight that and have spaces that we can recognize that and let black women know that we see them and we stand with them and we are working on things to fix these issues in our community but i will also say that as a provider too i think it's also just beautiful having the space to hear from patients in their uh, birthing stories, but also us sharing things that they may not know. And I think Dr. Mitchell made a good point about the preeclampsia. And just yesterday at a, on a panel, when Dr. Mitchell's uh, explained pretty much like, oh yeah, you know, like, because we know that black women have higher rates of preeclampsia, we start them on baby aspirin. And a black mom next to me, who's just in the community was like, wow, like I never knew that. I had, I got pregnant. No one ever told me that. Is that something that has, is new? And I'm like, no, it's been several years. And she was like, wow, like now I have to go tell my sister and I have to go tell my aunt and I have to go tell. And that is what this space is about. It's like educating on both sides, us learning from patients, patients learning from providers and us raising awareness about why this is so important because it's not acceptable to die just because of your race when there's no other genetic difference that makes it different pretty much. Every yeah. woman should see in childbirth. Yeah, I, I think that's beautiful. And and thank you, Leah, for sharing your perspective as both a provider and a patient. I think that, you know, it's it's so interesting and it's so important to hear from your perspective, right? And the decisions that go in, even just deciding before you get pregnant, do I want to get pregnant, right? And and all that goes into that. Um so I guess my follow-up question for, for maybe both of you is sort of knowing that and knowing that what you go through and the decisions you're making are similar to what other people are going through and what other patients are um, thinking about. Does that change how you interact with your patients and how you interact with your colleagues and telling them how they should be interacting with their patients? You know, like, how does that sort of interaction work? I think it it absolutely changes. Um let me back up. I don't know that it it changed the way that I interact with my colleagues or interact with my patients, but it certainly has given me a new perspective. Um, Dr. Louie probably can relate, but part of my why for even becoming an OBGYN is because of the disparities that exist for um, birthing people of color. So it doesn't necessarily change the way that I interact with people because that was my why to start. Um, but it certainly has given me a different perspective to be on the other side of it um, and a, a reason to, you know, be even more direct when I communicate with my colleagues and communicate with um, with patients. Um, for our colleagues who are of different backgrounds, they don't always have or may not have the sister or aunts or cousins or, you know, daughters who have had these experiences um, and so may not have that perspective. And so I'm open about sharing things and open about, you know, encouraging people to kind of look at things from the patient's perspective and kind of put yourself in their shoes. Um, one of the things that we see often on the floor is that sometimes family members of patients from different cultural backgrounds than the the people who are caring for them can be perceived as being aggressive or as being non-compliant or not listening, when in reality, that is fear. That family member is afraid for, you know, their daughter, their wife. Um, they are concerned about the outcomes of the baby and of mom, and they know those statistics. Um, but it may not present in the way that 
you know, is, is culturally acceptable or the cultural norm for the people that are caring for them. And so then it's perceived in a negative light, when in reality, it's not that. Um, and so I think my role really is to just try and, you know, encourage people to see the humanity in others and just, you know, imagine that everyone is coming at it from a, a, a from a good space, from a space of wanting the best for that birthing person, whether it's the family member or the nurses or the other doctors, we are all coming at it from, you know, wanting the best for that birthing person. So just take a step back if it, if something seems like it's not quite what it is. Thank you for sharing that perspective. I, I think it's something that sometimes gets lost uh, in a lot of specialties. And I, I think it's super important that you're sharing that. And I, I guess switching gears just a little bit, because this affects um, so many people, not just in Black maternal health, but in all maternal health. But, you know, reproductive justice and the rights of birthing persons, you know, changed significantly when the Dobbs decision came down and the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. So how do these realities, um, you know, the current realities impact black birthing people and how can faculty and staff and clinicians and, and even people in the community um, try to support equitable, equitable access to OBGYN care in our community? Um, so I think um, something to, to, I guess, highlight for, from our standpoint as OBGYNs is that reproductive justice and um, access to all of reproductive care is essential health care. And so it doesn't actually matter the race because all people need this care. But I will say that the disparities are higher for especially low income uh, patients of color who need these services and don't always have access because of where they live or access because of the financial cost. And so having limitations on the reproductive justice only widens gaps for their care. That is essential from our standpoint. Um, and so I think lots of support is always just, you know, to me demystifying all the myths of what reproductive justice actually looks like for patients, why it's important. I think having conversations like this is important for all people to kind of engage in. Um, I think something that I'm passionate about is advocacy. And so having a chance to go speak to our legislators and speak to um, people who are actually making these policies are important. And actually, I think one of the essential jobs of a physician, because our voice and our patients' voices can come through us and they matter. And I think that's one way, you know, to just ensure that all the voices are heard and that we're continuing to highlight this issue. Well, thank you so much, Leanne and Leah, for sharing this information. It's such an important topic, and your insight is, is so helpful um, it, it, for everyone, right? For providers, for patients, for our colleagues um, across Michigan Medicine, just to keep these things in mind when they're interacting with patients, when they're interacting with family members. And hopefully we can keep this conversation going the other 51 weeks of the year, right? Where it's not just Black Maternal Health Week, but that we talk about this all the time. So I appreciate the two of you. If you want to learn, learn more about Black Maternal Health Week and some of the other events that have taken place, go back to uh, go visit headlines at mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. All right, it's time for the lightning round. So we're switching gears from the very serious conversation <laughs> to the more fun uh, aspect of our personal lives. And Dr. Louie, you're up. So I, you get to be in the hot seat today. Are you ready to go? I'm always ready. <laughs> All right. So let's start in a big way. Who would you say has had the biggest impact on you during your career so far or during your education? Very good question. I've had so many people be a really big impact on me. Um, I will start off by saying uh, one mentor that I actually had starting in um, undergrad, actually. I was a first year and they were first year in medical school. And till this day, this has been what, over maybe 15 years, we have still kept in contact. Um, and along the way, uh, when I've 
heard of like discouragement or people are like, oh, maybe you shouldn't pursue medicine. Like he was there to be like, no, no, look at me. I'm a good, I'm a story. You know, I came from a low research background and if I can do it, you can do it too. And, and I think he was just such a good like impetus of like always like backing me up and always encouraging me to the point where when I made it into like medical school, then I've started to look back and try to reach and grab other people as well. Like he grabbed me and, and to this day, as I said, like I, I speak to him right now, like on a, at least every six months basis to just kind of check in. And he's always like, all right, what are you doing? How can we make you better? Like he's always like pouring into my life. And I think it's been so impactful because in moments where I didn't believe in myself, he believed in me and was kind of like, you know, encouraging me along the way. And then he encourages me to be a mentor. And now I love mentorship and I think it's so valuable. So he's had a really big impact on me. That's wonderful. I think that's one aspect of a lot of uh, a lot of jobs like these where you, you didn't probably get into this and expect that to be part of it. But now it's something that you really do get to enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, this is a completely different question. And I know you're not ready for it, but April is Natural Poetry Month. Are you into poetry at all? If so, who is your favorite poet? And if not, do you prefer reading or perhaps watching movies or TV or some sort of other art? Ah, oh, awesome. Um, actually, I'm not into poetry, uh, but I am into singing. And so I do sing. Um, and actually, uh, some of the OBGYNs in our department, we have a little band that we actually practice. And I'm the singer of the band. And one of the urogynecology fellows is the bass guitarist. Um, and then one of our interns, uh, OBGYN intern, she's the electric guitarist and then oh. also sings. We have a Gen Surge resident who like um, sings a little bit too. And then one of our now attending OBGYNs, her husband plays the drums. And so we get together and do like jam sessions. So technically not poetry jam sessions, but- not jam sessions. Yes. But and then my favorite singer, now that we're on the favorite uh, aspect, it's going to be Whitney Houston. And that is my go to karaoke song. I want to dance. There you go. When some would say she's a poet, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that is amazing. Jeremy, I think that's a headline story waiting to happen. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I need to know the name of the band. When do you perform? <laughs> where can we buy tickets? What's your latest album? What the whole deal? Listen, I have all the details. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. Send them over. All right, we may have already answered this question. I don't know. If you didn't go into medicine, what would be a dream job that you would like to have? Maybe it's singer in a band. I don't know. Oh. I am a big traveler. And I always say this, that if I could, I would be like a travel blogger. Um, and then at the same time, a book editor, because I also enjoy reading and I'm a bookworm. And so I was like, I'd love to do both things as a person who is also like loves to like read reviews and like base a lot of decisions on reviews. So I'm like, what a perfect kind of like conglomerate of jobs, a travel blogger, as well as a book editor. And I could be like, you know, uh, at the Eiffel Tower, you know, <laughs> like talking about my experience and then like reading, you know, someone's manuscript or like their book. And so I, I had thought about it. So a little right. bit different than the singer aspect. Yes, it is. But then you could do a concert at the Eiffel Tower too, if you wanted you to while you're there. You know? And I think you, you've seen the script beforehand. This is this is astounding, right, Jeremy? It, this is it, this took a turn I did not expect. I mean, you're you're dunking a basketball away from being the ultimate Renaissance woman. Um, <laughs> so, well, again, the the feature story on this it would be wonderful. All right. So, <laughs> last one. Uh, next week is Earth Day. Uh, it's on Monday. Um, so let's turn this into the travel question, since you love traveling. Uh, where on earth do you want to travel? If you could travel anywhere on earth, if there was no budget, no money constraint, what would it be and why? Mm, that's a good question. Okay, where would I go? I would say right now, one of my top destinations um, is New Zealand. I have uh, traveled to the Pacific, um, like islands, like the Philippines, for example, and I met quite a bit of lovely Kiwi people who told me that I would love New Zealand. And so I would love to just like go to New Zealand and backpack. And I've also heard some podcasts of some OBGYN that have actually moved to New Zealand because of how lovely they, <laughs> they found it. And so I'm like, I've got to go see this place. I've got to you know, see what is so wonderful about New Zealand that people leave America to move there, even as physicians, even like, you know, across the, the world. I, I've seen a lot of people say that they love New Zealand and that's a place I want to, I want to visit. 
There you go. And who knows, in 2030, you might be Auckland's newest OBGYN. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. All right. Well, thank you so much, Leanne, for playing along. That was a lot of fun um, and giving such thoughtful answers during our Black Maternal Health Week discussion. If you want to learn more about the week and the coinciding healthcare equity month going on at Michigan Medicine, be sure to go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. And while you're there, you can check out other featured stories from this week, including an incredible photo gallery from our colleagues enjoying the recent solar eclipse. Find that story and much, much more at mmheadlines.org. All right, Jeremy, so you just mentioned the eclipse. I need to know, were you able to take it in at all last week? Yeah, so uh, obviously it was a bright, sunny day in Michigan. Um, and the plan was to try and take the family down to Ohio, but we had a couple illnesses in the family and uh, the traffic looked awful. And so we let the kids stay in school. We brought our daughter out of preschool early and we um, we then all took a walk to get our son uh, just right down the street. And we watched it from his playground, um, felt the air drop several degrees and the, the birds really get weird. And then everybody left and it was wonderful. How about you? Yeah, so I actually was in right at three o'clock. I had a wheelchair repair appointment at wheelchair seating services at Michigan Medicine. Um, and so I was in there and I was the only like patient in there with the um, with with our wheelchair repair guy. And we obviously wanted to see the eclipse. So we went outside right at like 310 um, and it got dark. It looked like it was like nighttime. Basically, it was bizarre. But everyone was out there from that clinic. There was an infusion clinic right next door, and a lot of the team members had gone out there for, for that, um, and it was fun. It was um, a really cool, unique experience like as a patient at the time to then be experiencing it with Michigan Medicine team members. Um, we even like just finished the appointment outside. Like I remember like signing the paperwork just outside while we watched the eclipse, so it was definitely a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I certainly would have loved to see in the whole totality. And I had a few friends who went in the path and uh, it sounds like a tremendous experience. And those photos that we have, they're, they're, yeah. they're awesome to see. Yeah. All right. Well, it's time for the weekly trivia contest. And let's start off by saying congratulations to Amy Harrison. I know she is a faithful listener to this program. Uh, she sent in the uh, correct answer last week. And so Amy, uh, a member of the Department of Communication, will be in touch with you to help claim your prize. And so it's time to move on to this week's question. And the question is, what is the name of the holiday that marks the conclusion of Ramadan? Once again, what is the name of the holiday that marks the conclusion of Ramadan? You can find the answer in headlines, and once you know it, send it to headlines at med.umich.edu for a chance to win a prize, just like Amy. That's right. That's all the time we have for this week. Thank you again to our guests for joining us today, and thanks, as always, to our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. We'll see you next time. <laughs>